So first off, I'll warn you, I've run for public office and giving a platform to a former politician is rather dangerous. Um, but today I'm going to talk a little bit, uh, not about politics, but technology. And more about how technology is affecting us, um, how it changes our thought processes, and what it means to how we learn. So before I get into this, I wanted to give you a little context on how my brain works. Um, as you can see, um, large areas concentrated on all the important things in life, like random movie quotes, internet memes, and sports center highlights. Uh, my wife's sitting over here, and I probably should have carved out an area for like flowers and birthdays and stuff, but uh, you know, she knows how it is. <laughs> <laughs> so going back into um, history, uh, most folks thought that once we reach adulthood, um, our brain structure basically stopped changing. And a lot of recent studies have shown that that's not necessarily the case. There's a concept called neural plasticity, and the idea is that our brains remain in this plastic state um, in, a, in a place where they can change and be reshaped. And one of the more interesting studies was done with London taxi drivers. And what they did is they took an MRI scan before the taxi drivers started working, um, and then the drivers worked for several years in London, navigating the complex web of mangled streets. And a few years later, they did another MRI. And what they found was that their hippocampus, the area responsible for navigation and direction, became denser and more developed. So uh, not quite sure what the impact of driving on the wrong side of the road was, but um, I'm sure we can get a study for that in the future. So this is your brain. Uh, maybe not yours personally, but you may have seen the uh, advertisements in the 80s, the, this is your brain on drugs. Well, this is your brain on television. And what's interesting is when we perform passive activities, we don't trigger much activity in our brain. But just doing something as simple as basic math or working a crossword puzzle or any novel or new uh, concept that requires you to think triggers a much larger area of your brain. And this concept is important because what happens is over time, you create new networks within your mind. And your mind eventually develops and becomes proficient in this new activity and task. Um, again, I love internet memes. I saw this online. Someone said, every time you watch The Jersey Shore, a book commits suicide. Um, <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but I, I, I'm not a fan of the Jersey Shore, though I do watch the Kardashians every now and then. <laughs> Next slide. So inside of your mind, there are two basic structures. Um, we have gray matter and white matter. So gray matter sits on the outside of your mind, and it essentially does the work. It does the heavy lifting. And inside of your brain, inside the middle, is, is white matter. And the white matter essentially serves as the network between what I would call the computers, the parts that do the processing. And it's that white matter that essentially gets reshaped and we form new networks as, as our minds develop. So much like the roads in Delaware that are constantly under construction, our network and our roads inside our mind are constantly under construction as well. Um, this is pinky in the brain. This really has no context. I just like pinky in the brain, so I included it. So one of the pieces of evidence to support this idea that our minds evolved is a concept called the Flynn effect. So if we were to go back into the 1930s and have someone take a modern IQ test, they would score about an 80. Uh, today the average is 100. So over the past 70 to 80 years, we've essentially become 20 to 30 percent more intelligent. And some of that's been driven by things like better nutrition, better access to education, um, more stimulation. We have more technology around us and our brains are being stimulated more frequently. So what's it to be clever? What's it to be smart? A and some uh, neuroscientists have broken it down into two concepts. It's the concept of crystallized intelligence and fluid intelligence. So crystallized intelligence is really about facts, memorization, being able to recall something. If I asked you um, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, most of you would say, in 1492. Um, that's crystallized knowledge, something you've embraced. And then there's this concept of fluid intelligence. This is the uh, ability to take 
different points, different pieces of data, different knowledge, and recombine it, reformulate it to solve problems creatively. And what I'd hypothesize is that the idea of crystallized knowledge used to be extremely important. We used to really value the subject matter expert. Um, and that has changed a lot. And, and a lot of that is because technology has, has reshaped things. So why is this the case? Why is that knowledge base, that crystallized intelligence, less important? Well, information has become cheap. Um, the growth rate in information, our ability to access information quickly, has grown exponentially. Uh, if you think about it, um, each one of us right now has more computing power in our pocket than the NASA, than the NASA uh, flight to the moon, the first Apollo mission. Um, that's pretty impressive. And with that, we have access to everything. And I use this little story um, mainly because I'm a nerd, but friends and ours, we went out to go see one of the Superman movies a few years ago, and we got into a debate about General Zod. And we went back and forth, and my friend said, General Zod in Superman 3 was better. And I said, no, no, hold on, General Zod was in Superman 2. And this went on for a couple minutes until a friend Googled it, and. I was right, General Zod was in Superman 3, but that's not the point. The point is that that piece of information was instantaneously available. Just about every piece of data that mankind has created is instantaneously available. Data has become cheap. So now a word from Adam Sandler. Um, another interesting concept here is um, what social media has done to us. So Adam Sandler has made us well aware that um, alligators are not in fact ornery because they have all those teeth and no toothbrush. It's because they have an enlarged medulla oblongata. Um, I also attribute this to the uh, aggressive behavior of Philadelphia sports fans, but again, that has not been proven. But there's an interesting uh, challenge here. So we have a natural fight or flight instinct within our minds, and that's been broken down a little bit. So if you go online, you'll see a lot of aggressive content. Um, Patrick Warner speaking later. If you follow any of our threads, you'll see that we, uh, we trade barbs pretty regularly on the internet. But that barrier that's been created has created distance, and that fight or flight has really been broken down. So we don't have that instinctive reaction to kind of curb things back a little bit. We tend to be more aggressive when communicating online. Um, you may have seen on Saturday Night Live the uh, mean tweets um, which, right or wrong, many of them are directed at Justin Bieber. I'll leave it up to you to decide if that's warranted or not. But people tend to be more aggressive. So the other thing that's happening in addition to this aggressiveness is we're bombarded with interruptions. Tweets, Facebook, text messages, television. There's so many threads coming at us at all times. And some studies have shown that over time our capacity to focus, our attention span, has gone from somewhere in the range of um, 6 to 12 minutes down to seconds. Um, again, I don't know if this is good or bad, but this is just what the data is telling us. So you'll see here about 700 billion minutes were spent on Facebook every month. Uh, my wife might say that about half of that is attributed to me. It might be true, but we spend a lot of time online communicating. So. Uh, Another concept here tied into social networking, because social network is a big part of what we do now, is that it stimulates a lot of the same reactions that we'd have in normal conversations. We, we feel empathy for people we never met. We react with a, a rush when we hear good news or we see something that interests us. Um, it's kind of creating this environment where we're reacting to thousands and thousands of interactions like we were having those thousands of interactions in person. So we take all that and then we mix it all up in a blender. So we've got more data coming at us faster than it's ever come at us. It's coming from multiple angles. Our brains get rewired based on what we do on a daily basis. And then you couple it with this idea that technology is, is evolving at a rate it's never been seen before in history. So if you go back in time, um, the radio or television, the adoption curve was close to 50 years before it reached 90% of the population. If you go to modern technologies, um, cell phones or um, internet access, you're looking at a span of 8 to 10 years before it became saturated. So 
It's just a very accelerated pace of change that we haven't experienced before. And this affects the generations. So again, you have the GI generation who primarily was interfacing through uh, newspaper, single-threaded, once-a-day information. And now, you know, Gen Y and millennials have grown up with technology. They have information instantly. They expect to be connected. They expect to be um, communicated with on a constant basis. And it really has changed the structure and the way they think. And that's OK, um, but it poses some challenges for us. So here's the challenge in, in my mind. Uh, if you, again, look at history, our current education system the way we learn and the way much of what we do has been structured around the Industrial Revolution. So 100 years ago, factories were booming. We needed people that could memorize tasks, repeat them, and produce goods and services. Well, that's changed. Um, there's a lot of automation, and uh, that emphasis on facts and figures just isn't what it was before, because a lot of that can be automated. So technology is a good thing. I mean, it may sound like I'm, I'm bashing technology. It's a good thing. It's a force multiplier. It helps us grow the economy. It helps make us more effective. It's, it's a really powerful, powerful tool. The challenge is that those occupations, those tasks that were um, repetitive are declining precipitously and are being replaced with things that are non-repetitive, things that require creative thinking, things that require that concept of fluid intelligence, and we have to adapt to that. So I, I pulled a couple snippets of news that I thought was, were interesting. So if you, again, kind of look at this, um, starting in 1996, um, we kind of went from automation just being manual labor to we had a computer beat Gary Kasparov, the chess champion, in a game of chess. And that's evolved. Um, more recently, we've had the first automated bankruptcy lawyer. So there's a computer that can handle basic bankruptcy law. So think about that. It's not just automation in manual labor. It's now moving into anything that can be repetitive. That crystallized knowledge bucket um, is, is getting automated. So what does it all mean? I kind of threw a bunch of topics out there. One, technology is rapidly changing, and that's not going to stop. Two. Information is readily available, and it's cheap. It's everywhere. Three, we're going to continue to have technology. We're going to continue to have automation. That's not going to stop. Subject matter expertise, in my opinion, is going to become less important. And it's going to be replaced with the need for critical thinking and the ability to solve problems. We're going to have to shift the way we learn and the way we think away from rote memorization to more adaptive problem solving problem-based learning and creativity. So I stole this quote from the CEO of Ernst & Young. So Ernst & Young is a 60,000 person organization. They hire thousands of people every year. And the CEO basically said, you know, what you learn today will very likely be obsolete in the future. So don't worry about memorizing the facts. Don't memorize all the details. Think about how you learn, how you understand the data, how you understand digital technologies and how you combine it to solve problems. So the good news in all of this is, as we mentioned, our minds are adaptive. They've shown that they adapt. We've changed. We think faster. Our IQs have gone up. We just have to continue adapting. But we have to adapt our, our learning systems in accordance with that. As long as we continue to learn, we continue to progress, we'll be OK. Um, one of the things Steve Jobs said, and uh, it's an interesting little story, when he started with the, the Mac computers, um, he, he created kind of the first visual interface and the typeface settings. And somebody asked him where he came up with the idea, and he said, well, I took calligraphy classes. And somebody said, why did you take calligraphy classes? You're a computer guy. And he said, just to learn something new. But then he was able to apply it. So what I would encourage all of you to do is, as you move forward, think about how you learn. Think about what you can learn outside of your current skill set, because that's going to expand your mind. It's going to create new networks, and it's only going to make you more valuable. We have the most powerful piece of technology sitting between, between our ears. It'll never be replaced, but we have to continue to feed it.
Thank you so much.